So welcome to another EBFA webinar. Uh, I am very excited for tonight's topic. Uh, so we will just kind of jump right into it. If it is your first time tuning in to an EBFA webinar, uh, special welcome. Uh, the way that it's going to work is that we're going to run through. It's going to be approximately 30 minutes of lecture education, and then we will follow that with a 10 to 15 minute Q&A. So if you do have some questions, please type those in, even if you type them in throughout the webinar. There's a chat box on the bottom, and then we will make sure that we go through those uh, at the end. All of these webinars are recorded, archived, and they can be found on the EBFA YouTube channel, which is youtube.com backslash EBFA fitness. So if you want to listen to this again, you enjoy it so much that you want to share it with some of your colleagues, or you want to check out any of the other EBFA webinars, please do so via the EBFA YouTube channel. So we are ready to get started. Uh, we have a return guest educator and <clears throat> excuse me, and a Barefoot Chaining uh, Summit presenter, Kevin Moore from Hong Kong. Welcome, Kevin. Thank you very much. Very, very pleased to be here again. Excellent. I'm going to let you introduce yourself, and then we're just going to jump right into it again, because I know you have a lot to talk about, and I'm Good. very excited to hear what you have to say. Cool. Thanks. All right. Uh, I do. I have so, so much cool stuff to share with you guys. Uh, this is a topic I'm really personally uh, very invested in. It's become a kind of specialization of mine over the last uh, oh, year or so. Um, so I'm, I'm based in Hong Kong. I'm a sports therapist, uh, and I, I kind of jumped the line between working with, with rehab patients and working with performance patients. And so I'm always looking for cool ways of trying to do both at the same time. And uh, working with the hands and the wrist and the shoulder by extension uh, is is a really cool way to start looking for ways of combining that because of the specialization of that structure. And it is that specialization we're about to talk about right away. So um, let's advance here. When you know, For rehab people, docs, physios, when someone walks in the door, very frequently the first question we're looking at is how can I fix it? But, but I'm going to make the argument that that is in fact question number two. And if you're an athletic coach or an athlete yourself or a fitness person, how can I improve it is question number three. But the most important thing we have to know is what does it do? What does the structure accomplish? What's it for? Because if we understand function really, really deeply, then, then designing interesting, creative approaches to treatment and improvement are much, much easier. But that's tricky to do with humans because humans are super versatile, right? We can do all kinds of stuff. And because you know, we got time to spare and energy to kill, so we, we apply ourselves to all kinds of things. But make no mistake, we are biologically specialized, like every other organism on Earth. And one of the things we're going to try to uncover today is what exactly is that biological specialization and, and how does it relate to the hand and how can we use it to help us in a practical way. So if we jump uh, one more slide ahead, one of the things that makes it easier is to get away from thinking of specialization of behavior and instead of think of specialization of function. You know, there, there's an internal relationship at work uh, for the tissues of the body, and if we can understand that relationship, then we don't we, we don't so much care about how the structure is being used. We just care about how it's interacting. And the example I like to give, the analog, is is that this car you're looking at here on the screen. No matter what that car happens to be put to, or what any car happens to be put to, if it's an F1 racer or a dune buggy or a daily commuter, the specialization of function is that fuel is combusted in the engine in order to place torque on the wheels. And no matter what car that car is doing. That's the internal specialization, and it's useless without it. So we're going to try to find the analog uh, for humans. And what often, the kind of the conventional wisdom of what humans are good at or what humans are for is bipedalism and tool use. You know, and this is you know first uh, largely espoused by Charles Darwin, but we now know that there are a couple of holes in that theory, and actually there are some really interesting holes. Right when we when we start looking at the evolution of the human form, it becomes very easy to see where the, the strongest selection pressures started pushing on our structure, pushing on our behavior. So the biggest problem with the idea of bipedalism uh, coming first and yielding tool use is our next slide, uh, a species called Astropithecus afarensis. Uh, there was a a skeleton dug up not too long ago called Lucy. You may have heard of that. It was a major find. And she was really remarkable because uh, 
her hands are extremely human-like, and this is despite the fact that she predates any of the Homo lineage by a significant margin, and her human-like hands predate tool use by over half a million years. So what she was doing with her human-like hands was something other than making and using complex tools. So as we start wondering what that might be, we can take a look at the next slide, which this is really interesting. I spent a lot of time delving into this in preparation for this presentation. Uh, what you're looking at here is called a somatotopic map. And the two animals being compared, one Homo sapiens, that's us, the other is the Japanese macaque. And what we're looking at is the, the, a map of how the brain perceives all the individual digits. And what you see is that for the hands, the individual digits have a very well-defined somatotopic map. The brain maps each digit individually and uses it individually. For the foot, on the Japanese macaque, we have almost a, a very generalized pattern uh, for the foot. In the human, we have a ge generalized pattern in the peripheral toes, but a very specified one for the great toe. And if we advance the slide one more time, please, uh, what this tells us is that us and the Japanese macaque, before we split, so our common ancestors, some four million years ago, before apes started separating from monkeys, had a similar uh, function in their hand. Their brains were already ready to start using the hand in a certain way. So well after the split, you know, four million years later, we're still using our hands, at least in reference to our, our way we think and the way we sense our hands the same, but the foot continued to evolve. And that tells us that we started using our hands the way you and I use our hands today back when we were still quadrupeds. And that's really interesting because that definitely turns Darwin's theory on its head, but it also means that the selection pressures that started creating bipedalism, started creating tool use, may have come from what we were doing with our hands to begin with. So if it wasn't tools, which require manual dexterity, but we had the manual dexterity, well then what would we were doing? And if we save one more slide ahead, there's one really obvious answer, and that's throwing. Throwing is really interesting because not only does it require a lot of the same kind of precision grip functions and precision grip structures that our hand includes, uh, but it also requires an enormous amount of, of sensitivity and manual dexterity. You know, we're talking about accumulating enormous amounts of force in a projectile and then releasing it with sub-millisecond control. And if you don't have individual behavior of your digits, there's no way that's going to happen. I mean, and just think about, <laughs> if you can think about this, the, you know, the Pleistocene era development when the first primate went from holding a rock to throwing it, that must have been such an enormous leap in capability. Suddenly dangers that were a big deal were not a big deal. As a matter of fact, there's even some evidence to suggest that later on in like late homo species like Homo erectus, um, when they started using javelins, stone tip javelins, that we that's coincided with this massive extinction of megafauna of the larger of the larger animals that lived at the same time because the the hunting strategies were now so amazing that nothing could touch us it's pretty cool and it's easy to see why that why natural selection would take that one thing and want to uh, really really specialize in it so in addition to our hand being good at throwing there are three other major morphological components uh, that that made throwing something that we were good at and, and could do over and over and over again. And it's here, by the way, that we can start talking about treatment techniques. Because much like our car, we talked about a second ago, you know, the engine creates torque on the wheels and that's what they all do. Okay, so now we've got the hand. We now know what the hand was built for. Now we need, that's like the wheels. So now we need to talk about the engine, right? So how does the body start getting power into the hand? So let's take a look at our next slide here. One of the first and biggest ones, excuse me, is our height. Right, so bipedalism, we now know, was something that came after we had this throwing capability. And in fact, the taller we got and the more space that we got in that lumbar cavity, the more elastic energy storage we had access to. And that elastic energy storage is for throwing. It is for throwing. And we'll see in a second here how that, uh, we're going to prove that even further. Uh, but your obliques are awesome at transmitting torque energy from your pelvis into projectile energy coming through the shoulder and into the hand. So if someone comes into me and says, I have a grip strength problem, or a athlete comes into me and say, you know, I need to be able to hold longer or hold stronger or throw farther, this is a number one place I'm going to start looking. You know, actually, Dr. Perry Nicholson likes to say, you know, no matter what kind of problem you have, you have an oblique problem, 
and I, I totally agree with that, and this is part of the reason why. So if someone's not completing their, their rotational kinetic chain in either direction, that's going to interrupt how much force can pass through the shoulder and into the hand, and that will absolutely have, have an effect. Say, so look at the next slide. This one's really interesting. This is probably my favorite, my favorite little factoid I'm going to share with you guys today. Uh, another major morphological component in the development of throwing is humeral torsion. So the, actual, the, the humerus became slightly less, uh, uh, has less torsion in it as humans have been evolving. So we have a slightly, you know, the, the bone is, has less torsion, but that grants us much more access to elastic uh, extension in uh, external rotation, as this guy is demonstrating for us here with his creepy broken-like arm. Uh, but this is really cool, right? Because it's, what we now know is that for throwing, the, most of the energy conferred to the projectile comes through internal rotation of the humerus. As a matter of fact, internal rotation of the humerus is the fastest motion the human skeleton is capable of producing. And I think that's super cool. And, and the speed itself, for a practice picture that the guy you're looking at right now, upwards of 9,000 degrees per second the uh, humerus can internally rotate. And that doesn't blow your mind. I don't know what will. Uh, but what this means is that if a person, again, comes into me and says, I have poor grip strength, one of the things I'm very curious about is how well they can load their external rotation. Because it's not that they have to be bending their arm back like this every time they want to use their grip. But if this structure isn't available, or if that internal relationship isn't available, then the concentric actors in their hands are always going to be compensating for a feeling of, in, for a sense of instability because of that lack of uh, external rotation. This is especially common in the do dominant hand, by the way. Uh, okay, and then the last thing we'll mention here, uh, one more slide ahead, uh, is the pec major, right? It always kind of bothered me that the pec major was this enormous oxygen-hungry muscle, uh, but I couldn't really ever put my finger on why we would need something that big and that oxygen-hungry taking up all that space in our torso, torso. And as it turns out, in humans, the pec major really shows its strength in the cocking phase of the, of the throwing action. When the arm is overhead, the flexion moment of the pec major matches exactly the rotation moment of the spine. And this means that essentially it turns your arm into an extension of, extension of your spinal column and transfers that much more energy. So again, if someone says to me, I've got grip strength problems, or someone says to me, you know, I've got uh, uh, pain in my elbow or wrist whenever I try to make a fist, one of the things I'm very interested in is A, how well do you get your arm overhead, and B, how well does your pec major behave in flexion? And I, by the way, I see a lot, um, when we see kind of classical weight room training, you know, bench press oriented training, one of the things that can come from that is that we end up getting this very, very strong tissue in the pec minor, that is, or the, sorry, pec major, that is not very good at all at extending along the rotational axis, or sorry, flexing along the rotational axis of the spine. But this right here is what this muscle is for. So we have, we have so many places to look besides just the hand. And the more that we start delving into the internal relationships, the, the specialization of function, as we mentioned before, uh, the more we can be creative about, about designing uh, treatments and designing improvement programs. And that's something that I've, I've been working on now for a long time is is taking some of the advice that we often get from people that have wrist pain, uh, you know, the stretches we give them and the exercises we give them and the incredibly low <laughs> um, incidence of, of improvement coming from that kind of advice and trying to design different ways of approaching that problem that take into consideration these specializations. So let's get a little more deeply into the hands now. So if we advance one more slide, please. So every prehensile behavior of your hand follows one of two modes. The first is called the precision grip, and this is the one that's mostly involved in throwing. And uh, it's also the one you use, like for well, evolutionarily for tool use, but the same tool, the same thing you might use for for fine motor tasks. We have to pinch between the thumb and the first and second fingers. But what really makes the precision grip interesting is that first of all, the, the last two fingers are used as stabilizers at best, or not used at all. But the first two fingers, they don't have a very strong concentric flexion component. During the act of throwing, the concentric, or the, the flexors of the fingers, the first two fingers, behave eccentrically. They bend back a lot so as to confer all of their energy into the projectile. 
And when they snap forward, they don't necessarily close in grip the way you and I think of grip looking. You know, the thumb provides almost no power at all. Again, it's just there to keep the, that, again, that sub-millisecond control of when the projectile is released. But the first two fingers are designed to work eccentrically. And you can actually test that for yourself right now. If you take your, if you hold your hand out like in a, in a rigid kind of knife hand position, fingers long and stiff, and then bend your wrist into deep palm reflection, and then try to bend your pinky and your ring finger, and they'll flex right up easily. But if you keep your wrist flexed like that and try bending your first and second fingers, they don't bend that far, not nearly as far as the last two. And it's right there we can start to see a clue that, that when under strain, these fingers would rather act eccentrically than concentrically in flexion. Uh, and then if we look at the next grip style, it's called the power grip. And this is more what we think of when we think of grip. But what's really interesting is that it has very little to do with the first and second fingers. The last two fingers, the pinky and the ring finger, are, are grasping the object in a way so that at the most energetic point of that object's use, for the hammer we're talking about at the moment it strikes the object you're striking, for the rope we're talking about when you're starting to climb, or, or, when, you're, or sorry, when you're hanging, when you're in ma maximum eccentric load, that the object you're pulling on is in line with the longitudinal axis of your forearm. And so when we think of grip strength now, we can start getting a very different, much more complex picture of what that means. It's not just holding stronger. It's holding in a certain geometry with certain structures in a certain way. And so one of the most common um, problems that I come up against when someone comes into me with either nerve pain in the hands or uh, uh, poor grip strength is that they're using the wrong fingers for the wrong job, or that the wrist, or, or that they don't don't move their wrist enough in the correct way and they move it too much in the incorrect way. But if there's one thing you take away from today's webinar, I want it to be this: that the first two fingers, index and middle, confer an enormous amount of power, but would prefer eccentric behavior over concentric. The last two fingers confer slightly less power. But they love to be concentric as long as they can manipulate an object in relationship to the forearm. So here's some geometries you can start thinking about. And I have found that actually uh, like carpal tunnel syndrome has become such an easy problem to fix these days <laughs> uh, in my practice because uh, as soon as I watch someone, you know, I'll have them pick up an object, hold their, uh, like pick up a ball, hold their arm overhead, move their arm in a circle, and just through those three things, I can immediately see, A, which morphological structures are not contributing to their grip, and B, which fingers are they using for which tasks, and then it's just a matter of cueing them into the next, into, the, into a new type of movement. And it's, it's shockingly easy, to be honest. Um, so, to, to go a little more into that, we're all going to do a little experiment now. So I hope you all have hands free, because I'm going to have you try some stuff with me here. Let's go on to the next slide. So I'd like everyone to hold their hands outward as I'm demonstrating right here. All right, rigid fingers, flat palm, uh, elbows and arms are kind of raised off the ground, right? So I want you, you know, you're using your shoulder muscles at the moment to support the weight of your arm. Now, before you go to the next slide, I'll give the cue. I want everyone to raise their fingers up. Bend your fingers up. And after you've done that, now advance the slide, please, Emily, because what I'm going to bet is that everyone is doing this now. So their fingers came up, but I'll bet that the wrist dropped down. And what this indicates when you see it is that the forearm or the, the extrinsic muscles of the hand are no longer acting eccentrically on that upward motion in the fingers. Instead, the palm is acting eccentrically and, and it's trying to get the forearm to act concentrically to feed that power, but that's a super inefficient way of doing that. That's like a microcosm. You want, that, you want that finger extension to be drawing power all the way up from like the serratus anterior. You want that coming from the forearm. Forearms, you come to be acting eccentrically. So now, shake your hands out for a second. Start again. And this time, when you lift your fingers up, let's go to the next slide, please. I want to see if you can make it look like this. Can you get the fingers to rise, but also get the wrist to either stay level or actually to technically to rise a little bit with the fingers? Because if you look at this slide versus the last slide, the relationship of the finger to the hand is totally the same. There's no change in angle there. The only thing we've changed is, is the eccentric power being drawn all the way up the chain, or is it coming only from the palm of the hand? Now, 
if you're doing this with me right now, and I hope you are, I want you to just hold your hand in this possession for about 30 seconds. Because a couple things are going to happen. One, you'll be able to feel the, the stretch and the eccentric load down the forearm. And two, I'll bet that if you stay here for a little while and you have your arms up in the air, you're holding them in the air, you're going to start to feel concentric effort in your serratus anterior. I'll bet you're going to feel your serratus anterior pumping up. For those who don't know where their serratus anterior is, it's right under your armpit. Right? So if you go you know, from the armpit straight down, there's that little bulge of muscle right above the oblique over the top of the ribs. That's serratus anterior. And if you reach back and poke that at the moment, I bet it's hardened. And that's one of the things that this eccentric forearm does is it sends a chain and it sends a it sends a signal up to the shoulder to bring power from the shoulder blade. And we know that it does that because we know it was evolved to do that. And this is just our little test. So I hope you all were able to feel that. Uh, if you couldn't feel that, feel free to complain to me later. <laughs> um, so this is just a, this is just one example of of little little tricks, little tests, little stretches we can do to start playing with these relationships and designing uh, new ways of approaching old problems. And I know that the people signed into this webinar right now come from a multitude of backgrounds: trainers, massage therapists, doctors, physiotherapists, whatever. You know, I'm I'm interested to see how all of those different disciplines might take this theory and apply it to what you're doing. Because really that's my goal, is, is to make the theory really, really clean so that individuals can come up with their own uh, treatment solutions. So let's advance one more slide ahead. That being said, of course, I do have plenty of treatment solutions that I like to use. And if you would like to know what those are, you can go to my website here and um, I wrote this article some time ago about weight bearing during push-ups and, and how kind of widespread pain in the wrists is as a result of doing that kind of exercise. Uh, and I was trying to help people through that with some pretty simple tricks. And it turns out that's one of my most popular articles on my page uh, and it's helped a lot of people. So if you'd like to know what that's about, you can read there. I've also got links to a couple other uh, hand and wrist resources uh, within that article. So if you're interested, please feel free. Also of note, um, uh, I do workshops in this kind of thing. So if you, kind of wherever you are in the world, if you have either an athletic organization or a gym or a clinic that could use some new programming, I, I provide a, a wide range of workshops teaching these kind of theories and practical skills as a result. And I'd be happy to share those with anyone who needs them. This is just one of the, uh, one of the workshops I have going right now um, for kind of basic gym exercise and, and kind of doing it a little bit smarter. Um, all right, and then one more forward, one more um, slide forward. I actually forget. Oh yeah, oh yeah, there we go. And then here's here's um here's most of the reading that I have done um, to kind of trace this evolutionary pattern. If you're looking at this page right now, I want you to take a look at the fourth one down, elastic energy storage in the shoulder and evolution of high speed throwing in homo. That is a fascinating article, and in particular, if you are kind of into the geeky, geekier side of body work, um, uh, that is a super, super interesting study, and and there's so much information there to delve into. Um, and another kind of a, a personal note, the one just below it about the oldest javelins predating modern humans, I had so much fun reading that, and it turns out there's this team of scientists who whose job it was to try to recreate old javelins, to, you know, to recreate javelins that would have been built during like the Pleistocene era uh, and, and later, using only the, the materials they would have had available, and then trying to throw them to see what the impact strain was like on the material. And I could not help but thinking that those guys have the coolest damn job in the world. <laughs> um, anyway, so uh, that's it, folks. And I can't believe I was able to get through all that information in 30 minutes, but uh, 25, technically. Uh, uh, but now I'm ready to take any and all questions you might have about that, and I assume there are probably a couple. Yes, awesome. Thank you so much, Kevin. Um, that's really fascinating what you say about, I'm just thinking of uh, when I do my aerial yep. and things, and the, how you're saying that the, the littler two digits play a much better role in strength. Yep. Kind of that. So I'm going to pay attention to that, which is quite fascinating. Um, yeah. I, I think I asked you this in India, but from I was a gymnast for 13 years, and the way the gymnast, which is very different from other 
sports is that our thumb is always on the inside. So mm. for, for years, like we're talking until I started doing silks, really, all of my strength, I, I'm much, much stronger with my thumb on the inside. And that's mm. like, that's with every single thing that I do. So when I do pull-ups, I do it that way. Now, mm. because, because of trapeze and lira and all of that, you have to have the thumb on the inside and I'll actually like play around. I'm much weaker with the thumb on the inside. Have you ever heard that? Or do you know any, do you think yeah, it's yeah. natural strains or something? Um, this, um, this actually is also mirrored in martial arts work. Okay. So we're doing like gra grappling arts. Placement of the thumb is a really important element. And that's one of the things is, is kind of getting, making sure that n none of your gripping comes from your thumb. Because not only is the thumb itself, I mean, like, okay, so we have a very robust set of musculature which controls our opposable thumb, but that robust musculature does not extend beyond the hand. And so no matter what you do with the thumb, it is never going to be as strong as the fingers, which connect all the way up to the shoulder blade. Um, and, and so, you know, in a martial arts context, if you want to make a strong grip, the trick is always to get the fingers to hook around, get the thumb out of the way, and then use the fingers to manipulate the geometry of the thing you're trying to pull on. Um, so yeah, it, it would make perfect sense to me that that once you stop gripping with the thumb, there will be a there will be a, a momentary sense of instability. Uh huh. But uh, it, that that will go away once the once the fingers get an idea of what it is you're you're asking them to do. Incidentally, I I, I kind of relate that a little bit to. Uh, foot function in that, I mean, again, we're talking about analogous structures, right? So the, the same way that in the dominant foot, one of the things I frequently see is that the forefoot, like the hallux of the dominant foot tends to pronate early because contact on the dominant foot on the hallux feels very strong. There's a lot of very, it feels very secure for, for right side or for, uh, for people who really are very strongly dominant. But once you get the, the forefoot to stop pre-pronating, it feels more unstable for a moment until you get the idea that you can use the whole foot. And I kind of think of the same thing. Stop gripping with the thumb, it'll feel insecure for a second, but once you get a sense you can use the whole hand instead, it's way, way stronger. Mm. Yeah, that's fascinating. Um, I don't know if, if anyone has any questions, they can definitely type it in, uh, and then we'll relay those to Kevin. I have another question. Really? No questions at all? I, I'm, I am beyond fascinated with the grip because of self. But um, I can totally tell that what I do before aerials, whenever I'm taking it, is I release my psoas because I can totally tell a change in my grip if my rotation is compromised. So Totally. And it's, it's amazing that people don't – uh, that's not the first thing that they, they go to, you know, as far as seeing how people warm up, uh, the upper body for silks and things like that is they focus a lot on just like, you know, literal shoulder mobility, but there's very little trunk mobility, um, which is quite fascinating. And that's what I want to start exploring a little bit more on. on yeah. And actually, if, can you click back through to that, um, slide of. The javelin thrower, Kim Mickle. Sure. One of the, I, I, I love this slide. I love this picture. Matter of fact, for a long time I had it as my desktop picture. Um, uh, and one of the things I really, really love about it is if you, if you, I mean, every element of her body is currently in rotation. Mm -hmm. And in particular, I love the way that the, the non-dominant shoulder is in that deep internal rotation. The dominant shoulder is in that deep external rotation. Her waist is turning. Her ribs are counter-turning. Both of her legs are in counter-rotation. And you can just really get a sense. Like once you, once you understand the physics behind something like this, you can really get a sense of how much torque is currently being applied to that javelin. And, um, you know, it's it, – again, I know I mentioned this once already, but, you know, when we're looking at classic weight room exercises, one of the things they so frequently omit – is the ability to use torque. You know, when she throws that thing, it's going to go about 660 meters. It's going to go really, really far. And when we take then something like, again, uh, uh, like a bench press or even like a, oh, what's like a cable fly, something we might use with grips and hands, um, we're, 
we're so often told to stabilize by bracing the abdominal wall and not rotate, right? To stay square to, to the, the weight. But as it turns out, that's actually a pretty inefficient way of approaching moving a weight. Mm -hmm. I mean, like in a, in, a, in a lifestyle environment, like if it, outside of a gym, you, you would never push a weight that way. <laughs> that would be much too hard. Uh, but yeah, all of these torquing structures are just so cool, and the way they work together is so cool. Yeah, definitely that, that was one of the biggest take-home themes through the India Summit is that power through rotation. And yeah. I talk about a lot from lower extremity power where the, the foot is driving these rotations in the lower extremity. But seeing that exact same thing in this picture, how her left arm is going towards this internal rotation in the left, mm -hmm. completely fascinating, that, that power of torque in the transverse plane. Um, so I hope, I hope the people who are listening feel, <laughs> feel the exact same excitement that I feel on this topic. So, yeah, I, mean, so uh, I have to admit, like putting this presentation together, and actually I'll be writing an article about this topic um, uh, for a magazine pretty soon uh, here in Hong Kong. Uh, and I'll be distributing that later as well. Uh, but yeah, it's just, it's just become like my new favorite thing. I also work with a group of fencers in Sydney, Australia. Um, and I've been, in, I've been working with them to apply this kind of theory to their fencing practice. And we've had some amazingly cool results. As a matter of fact, we just published a paper, um, uh, which we'll be presenting in Barcelona in September at the 7th Annual Congress on Sports Technology. Um, uh, that's all about the application of torque uh, to a different style of lunging and fencing. But it's just, it's like when, once you have the theory, like once you understand how these pieces work together, you can apply it to anything, you know? You can, it, could be, it could be any sport, any activity. The pieces all work together the same way, no matter what you're trying to get them to do. And that just makes our job so much easier, you know? Yeah, no, I think it's, I think it's great. So um, if nobody has any questions, I could keep coming up with questions or... <laughs> Let it proceed. And then Kevin had his email on there. Kevin is easily accessible um, via social media. Check out his blog. And then as far as future things from EBFA is where we're continuing our expansion towards the, um, the distal aspect. So we're going to be start exploring grip strength as it relates to foot to core sequencing. And we'll just continue it out into the grip. So uh, we will be having more on grip through EBFA, and Kevin has some amazing stuff, so he'll be looped in with that as well as we develop um, new content. And uh, thank you guys so much. Thank you again, Kevin. Mm, it's my pleasure. All right. Have a wonderful night, everybody, or if it's your morning, have a great day. I will see you soon on another EBFA webinar. Thanks, folks.